Hello, I'm James Yardley, and today I'm joined by Edmund Harris, the elite rated manager of the Guinness Asian Equity Income Fund. Edmund, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. So why should investors consider Asia for income? Asia is an interesting region um, as a source of income, combining, as it does, quite a high level of income, attractive yields, and in fact, quite fast growth in income streams. Um, if we have a look at developed Asia versus emerging Asia, you'll find that most of the income in absolute terms is coming through from developed markets. So that would be Australia, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore. But the growth from that area is pretty moderate, running at about 2 to 3% per annum over the last 5, 10, 15 years or so. However, if you look across at emerging Asia, which incorporates the higher growth regions um, of China, but also strong growth coming through from Taiwan and Korea um, and Southeast Asia, you're looking at an average growth rate of around 4%. And over the next couple of years, dividends are expected to grow 17%. And that's a mixture both of earnings growth and a higher willingness to pay out income and a higher willingness to distribute profits um, to shareholders in the form of dividends. And so when you look at Asia as a source of income, it sits quite well alongside Europe and the UK. What Europe and the UK offer are comparatively high yields, but rather more modest dividend growth. Asia's dividend yield fractionally lower, just under 3% versus Europe's 3% and UK 4%, but with that growth. And that, I think, is one aspect that makes Asia a good source of income. And the second is the diversification of income streams we can get across countries and across sectors. So we are deriving in the fund quite a bit of income, obviously, from our Australian position, but also from China, uh, Taiwan and Korea, um, which reflect the asset allocation of the portfolio. And across sectors, we're also not too concentrated. We've got maybe a quarter of our income coming through from banking, but we've got another 22% coming through from consumer discretionary, which is the sort of rising middle class and the creation of the consumer economy in Asia. We've got another 20 odd percent or so coming from electronics manufacturing and particularly out of Taiwan. So, you know, we've got a spread going on, and underlying that, we also have health and staples uh, and, and real estate investment trusts and so forth, also contributing to, to the portfolio. But it's, it's quite a broad spectrum. And your strategy is quite unique. Um, you've got 36 equally weighted holdings, and I think you rebalance them quite regularly. So what is your thinking behind that? Why, why have you taken that approach? Well, our approach is very much from a stock-specific basis, rather than looking um, at an aggregate regional basis, which if you were to follow the index, you would find uh, heavily dominated by China and in turn heavily dominated by a few stocks in that China universe, uh, particularly the sort of high market cap, market capitalization businesses, the large companies in the e-commerce sector like Alibaba or, or, or Tencent. And we think that's not a terribly useful way um, to approach investing in Asia and in, in, indeed diversifying your income. So we go for an equally weighted portfolio. 36 names gives us a decent spread, we think, between stocks and between sectors. It also means that I am taking a high conviction uh, position in every stock uh, that I buy, that I am confident in the earnings power of this business, the profitability of this business, the sustainability and growth of that dividend, and in its valuation. And being happy in, that, in, in, in those metrics, I will put that in the portfolio in an equally weighted position. And what that means is that the risks and the returns and the income streams are evenly spread across the portfolio and we avoid the particular concentrations. If we had been heavily into 
um, Alibaba and Tencent in the way that the index would lead you. We would have had a miserable time this year, but the fund has done very, very well, um, outperforming and rising strongly in a falling market because we do not have those concentrations. And in fact, we emphasize um, the growth and income qualities um, that we're looking for. Very good. And all eyes are on the US at the moment. Um, everyone's focused on inflation and interest rates possibly going up. What impact has that had on Asian equities? High interest rates, high inflation out of the US um, have an impact on valuations. Rising interest rates reduces the present value of future earnings from companies. So companies that are expected to grow their earnings and deliver high growth years out into the future, as interest rates go up, that reduces the value of those future earnings in today's money. And the effect of that is to bring down valuations. People are not prepared to pay as much as they were for high growth stocks with earnings um, a few years out in the future that aren't worth as much today. And so with that valuation headwind coming through from the US, that does to some extent act as a bit of a headwind in Asia, but it's only really hurting those stocks for whom high future growth prospects have been priced into that valuation. And many stocks in Asia don't do that. At the moment, Asia is one of the very few regions that is trading at a discount to its uh, long run average. So it's trading more cheaply than it, than it has been. And stocks at the aggregate level are pricing in earnings that are being delivered today but very little account has been taken in the valuation of future growth. So it reduces the, uh, the, the growth risk or the valuation risk um, to, to Asian stocks. But to tackle the, the inflation question in particular, um, whereas consumer price inflation has been rising strongly in the United States and in the UK and in the EU, it has not really been such an issue in Asia. Consumer price inflation remains somewhat lower, um, with the exception of Korea and Singapore. That means that there is little pressure on Asian central banks to lift interest rates there to counter that effect. So the risk of, of higher interest rates from that source is, is, is that much lower. So while we may see um, some moderate increases in interest rates just to kind of keep pace with what's going on in the US and Europe. Um, we don't see um, significant pressure in interest rates in Asia coming through just yet. And why is inflation uh, a bit lower in, in most Asian countries then? Is it just a different basket of goods which uh, consumers are buying and I think that's true. I think um, you have uh, you have a higher um, component of food in the inflation basket, so there may be some, uh, some technical reasons. But consumer prices overall haven't been subject to the cost price pressures um, that have affected uh, many product prices and, and, and headline inflation rates through supply chain pressures or materials pressures. So what we are seeing in Asia are modest increases in consumer prices, but where we are seeing pressure is on, on producer prices. That is yeah. the cost of inputs to making stuff and moving it around. So materials prices have moved higher. So iron ore costs, wood, um, zinc, nickel, copper, uh, cotton, all of these sort of raw materials costs are up. Shipping costs, um, have been elevated. And all of that has meant that factory prices, therefore, have gone up. But those price increases haven't really been passed through into the Asian consumer markets. They've been much more visible in the, in the developed markets, the US, yes. Europe, um, and, and UK. And I think at least a, a big component of that 
has been not so much the increase in materials costs, but the rise in shipping costs has been astronomical. Um, so the shipping costs um, for dry bulk goods, so that is the movement of these raw materials, went up and then they went down again. I mean, they, they, the, the cost to move a, a ton of iron ore or coal or grain or liquids um, is now back at 2019 levels. But the cost of container shipping, that of finished goods arriving on our shores, has gone up by a factor of five and stays there. And that has quite a big impact on the end price of goods that are, being, uh, that are now going onto our shelves. And China is obviously a huge part of the Asian market. Uh, China had a very bad year last year. Um, what are your thoughts on it now? Is it now at a valuation where it's looking very interesting, or are there still worries to be concerned about? Well, that rather brings me back to that equally weighted question that you had, because China had a bad year when you look at its index, dominated by the e-commerce sector, hmm. which has struggled with two elements. Firstly, <clears throat> intensifying competition within the sector as the market matures, because there are only so many people you can sign up, and most people have been signed up. So now these companies are having to compete uh, with one another and having to invest a lot more. And so therefore, growth assumptions have had to be scaled back and valuations have come down. And the second issue was the regulatory pressures that were brought in as a consequence of some of their anti-competitive behavior in the wider sense, which has hurt merchants that use their platforms and, and, and consumers. So China has had a weaker year at the index level, but underlying that, not done too badly at all. So China valuations right now are probably the most interesting they have been in a number of years. Excess valuation has been shaken out, and now China is trading at around an 8% discount to its long-run average, which is very interesting. It is also looking now to offer growth, uh, earnings growth of around 9% per annum over the next couple of years, which it keep, with which it keeps pace with the aggregate um, index level, not too far off developed market earnings, uh, but is a lot, lot cheaper. When we have a look at interesting sectors within that, over the next couple of years, the consumer discretionary sector, we're looking at earnings growth of around 35% over the, per annum over the next couple of years. Consumer staples around 14%. Um, the industrial sector around 30%. So we're looking toward a reacceleration of economic growth in China as policy support kicks in. But we're also <clears throat> looking at that to, to feed into um, underlying company earnings. Now, in our portfolio, we hold 11 Chinese positions. Seven of those 11 in the last year outperformed the index and were in positive territory. Um, and they range from China Construction Bank to Shenzhou, a textiles manufacturer or resources gas, um, a, a gas utility. Even China Overseas Land, a real estate developer, um, made good money for us last year. And that's in a sector that is not popular at the moment. We have a mainland, mainland China listed dairy company, also an outperformer. And in our top 10 holdings, or top 10 performers, should I say, we had very strong performance out of China Medical and China Merchants Bank. So for our portfolio, China was a good year for us last year, but it is a matter of finding those businesses and rather than going for themes, focusing um, on earnings. One of the most interesting areas, I think, right now is on offer in the China financials sector which although is offering slightly slower growth than the market overall, is trading at over a 20% discount to its long run average. And I think there is very good value um, to be had there because it is priced for, for distress, um, a distress that is not there. Edmund, thank you very much. Those are some really interesting insights. Thank you very much.
And if you'd like to learn more about the Guinness Asian Equity Income Fund, please visit fundcaliber.com.